You ready? What's going on, guys? This is Zach here with Andrew. We're going to talk some college football, college fantasy, um, pretty much whatever we want to talk about. It could be, could go either direction here. So, um, Andrew, how you doing, man? I'm good, man, dude. I at, at the same time you teed this up, ESPN just started playing a video in the background of my. Of, of my browser and I was like why is this coming from Zach's computer or what's going on here so I hate ESPN's website I hate it it's atrocious yeah like, it's, it's, it's as big of a company as it is it's pretty terrible like as I, far as I've, I've stopped using them in pretty much any capacity on mobile especially um they're like still digging stats out at like high level stats um they're fine that like their their UI is fine for like just quick references for Team right. by team type stuff, but it it's borderline unusable for lots of the stuff that I want to do. Yeah, I've I think I told you that we had a conversation about this a few months ago. I think about like what do we use for our stat? Or like how do we check stats and scores and stuff? Like I exclusively use like, well, I say exclusively for college football. I use Yahoo, the Yahoo Sports app, and then for NFL and NBA, I use the Score app, which is. It's weird. Don't ask me why I do it. I guess it's just so I can, I know when I click the Yahoo sports college football comes up. And then if I click score NFL comes up, I don't have to like switch around in the app. Like it's just a thing I do, I guess. I, I was living and dying with the score for about 10 years, I guess at this point until their, their app crashed in like the middle of this, the college football season on like a, on a, on a Saturday afternoon. So I, and it was down all Saturday afternoon, so I, I finally gave in and tried out the action app that all all the a lot of our fellow de degenerates are all about. And it, it's it's sweet. I mean, I, I still use score probably 80, 90 percent of the time, but action is is definitely quality. And I, I've told you this, but the, the best thing about the action app is that they give you that countdown from uh, at halftime when the game. Oh yes. Back. So you don't have yeah. to just keep hitting refresh on the score. You actually know it's got four minutes and twelve seconds left until yeah, second. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Like I, I used that for a while mainly to track bets. Yeah, like it's, it's a good way to do that. Um, Definitely. You know, it, it's I, super sleek. I mean, prop and credit where it's due. It's a, it's a dope app for sure. Yeah. So I guess to sum all this up, ESPN's app is eh, their website sucks and don't use it. Yeah. That's what Got we're driving it. towards. All right. So we're going to kind of jump into – you want to talk about college football or just like college fantasy? Like which direction you kind of want to go here? Because there's a lot of things we could talk about. College fantasy obviously is like it's the off season, if you will. Yeah. Well, but, I mean, I, I would say let's start off with college football and we'll, we'll invariably head down the fantasy road. Okay. Because it's kind of it, – it's obviously linked. But like – all right. We'll just talk about that. So – You've got the transfer portal that is basically eliminated the college football off season, right? It's like it's like free agency essentially in like the NBA. Everybody's talking about oh man, all these big moves and all this stuff. And now you have it basically in college football where if a guy he doesn't even have to not play if he just says you know what I want something new he can he can move um, or if he doesn't feel like he's getting enough playing time. He can move, and we see it everywhere. Um, so do you feel like there's a player or players in particular that will be kind of headliners as far as transfers? Let me, so when I want to actually parlay your idea of whether we want to talk college football or college fantasy and apply it to the transfer portal. On a, a take that I'm still workshopping and don't have it down exactly – kind of to the point that I want to, but I, I'm starting to form a pretty definitive opinion on the transfer portal as it relates to college fantasy football in the sense that I think it may, it, I think it does a, one thing very, very definitively in that it, it makes, it makes the game that much harder mm -hmm. and not just college fantasy football, but also I think when you talk about trying to bet, upcoming seasons right moving from the end of one season up into the new one it makes the edge for people who want to really grind it out and put in the work that much greater um so when you're talking about betting 
futures in the off season, right? Whether it just be mm-hmm. win totals or com- or um, conference uh, championship winners, I think it was already hard enough for uh, books to put out accurate numbers for college football and relative to fantasy. I think that <laughs> any individual that's trying to track uh, college football from the end of one year to the beginning of the next one form accurate assumptions form real opinions that are going to hold water when the games actually kick off. It was difficult enough. And now the transfer portal just makes that all the, all the more difficult. Um, yeah. Well, I want to jump in real quick. I want to say something. So yeah. it, you say like it, the people who put the work in to, you know, yeah. to dive in and try to find it, it makes it more rewarding, but you could also look at it as so much more unpredictable too. Like if you have a guy that was not really established where he was or whoever that may be. And he goes to a team that's pretty good already and has established players. Like how much does he take away from the guys that were already there versus take, or does he just take the whole job away from somebody? Right? Like we don't know. And you won't know that until, you know, get to spring practices and and see kind of how that goes. And then you get the coach speak anyway. Oh, you know, he's working hard. You know, he's learning the plays, blah, 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 all that crap, right? Then you get to week one and he's starting and you had no idea. Like, it, it makes it a little more unpredictable. I'm, I'm looking at it more like wide receiver positions. Oh, it's the, there's definitely lots of unpredictableness to it. But I think that it's just – what a, a lot of a lot of people probably do right is you roll over the end of 2021 mm-hmm. you subtract who left and you make assumptions maybe about coaching staff more or less and then you set expectations for 2022 um yeah. and now we've got absolute chaos going comings goings all this stuff and it just yeah. it's going to make it that much more difficult i think for um both in fantasy and in sports betting and I think yeah. that it require that much more effort. And it's a good and bad thing. In the, the, it's a good thing in the sense that, I mean, the thing that I love the most about college fantasy football and college football in general when it comes to just betting it is you get it out of it what you put in, right? If you're trying to take shortcuts, it's probably not the game for you. But at the same time, like how how does that help grow the, grow the game? Like p- people who just want to kind of hop in and have a good time, they're going to get slaughtered. So that's yeah. probably great. You know, and I've, I've, I've kind of learned that this year where I haven't like stepped away from it. Like I'm still involved, like, you know, doing my, my research, you know, but I'm not diving in as deep as maybe I was in years past. Um, Mainly the lack of just time. And honestly, just, I don't really want to put that effort in right now. Like I feel like, you know, my life is in a spot, right? I got kids and all that stuff. So it's like, man, I, I would have no life if I did that, like that would be my life. And I don't know that I want that to be my life, which nothing wrong with it. But um, like you say, though, the, the fact that the game of college fans football needs to grow, it's hard to grow when the complete degenerates, like, you know, well, I'll include myself just for the sake of this, like us, that we have a like superior advantage over the casual person who just wants to come in and, have a good time play fantasy football yeah Um, like in nfl like there's 32 teams and you know who those 32 teams are you know who the good players are on all those teams for the most part um so you go into your draft it's the same players and you could do every uh, you know 100 drafts and all the players are going to be the same just maybe picked in different spots right um in college fantasy if you do all 130 teams like you're going to have a wide range of outcomes like maybe your first couple rounds are going to go pretty similar but like after that it starts to kind of vary a lot depending on how you like a player like where you're from like what if you're on the west coast like you're probably going to be more biased to those players like it just that happens but as far as i kind of want to get away from the fantasy part Let's, let's let's talk about this college football any moves, head coaching, quarterback, any transfers that you want to talk about that will just be exciting to watch in general? I mean, there's there's so many. I mean, right? you talk about Lincoln Riley at USC. Like, I'll, I'll ask the question. Do you think they're an instant contender to win the Pac-12? 
I think both the Big 12 and Pac-12 are going to feel seismic implications of Riley going to USC. So much talent leaving OU. Of mm-hmm. course, they bring in good recruiting classes, right? And they're getting talent right. uh, coming in through the portal as well. But I don't think it nets out to z- I don't think it's net zero. And I also think that the what we're seeing in the on the Pac-12 side, right, with Riley presumably going to have looking well i think you will have more success than usc has had in recent years oregon maybe comes down a notch um with uh crystal ball leaving transfers uh kind of fleeing from there as well i mean i have faith in dan Lanning. that dude just played a, a serious role in bring my team a national championship <laughs> um, but i think that I don't know. I don't think it's fair to have expectations that are super, super high for them in year one. So I, I think overall, like Riley going to USC has the the biggest takeaway from that is relative chaos in the Big Twelve and Pac twelve for this upcoming year. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I was actually talking with somebody um, that I work with about this, um, about Riley going to USC, and the way I look at it is. I, I know that it'll take a little bit of time to kind of to get everything gelled together and, and work like he had it at Oklahoma, but the Pac-12 South, it's Utah, right? Like it may be Arizona State. Like UCLA is tough, but I, I feel like they should be a 10-win team. I mean, the, he's going to build a winner there for sure. I, I, I mean, right uh, off the bat, I feel like a ten, ten, like if they don't get ten wins, I'm kind of disappointed. Do you have the schedule up? Uh, I do not, but I can pull it up. Um, I mean, that got like there. I'm starting to more proactively form real hatred for these coaches that run these systems that just they're supposed to be high flying attacks run fast pace, throw the ball over the place right. and, or maybe not so much throw the ball over the place, but score lots of points, run a fast pace, high play. octane and offense. And the, the, like you and I could play wide receiver for these teams and it wouldn't matter because wide receivers are not involved. I'm thinking Oregon, I'm thinking Riley's offense the last couple of years. Like what I don't, if you're a wide receiver, why are you going to play for this dude when your job just seems to be just block and maybe you're a plug and play. Uh, you're a plug and play guy. Like wide receivers seem to be like, look, we'll get all this talent. If we have to lean on these guys, we have this talent at our disposal, but we really don't want to lean on them. So yeah. like you said, why would you, if you're a four or five star wide receiver, you're going there, whoever the quarterback is, because the quarterback's probably going to be a Heisman contender, right? <laughs> like that's the idea. I guess that's the thinking behind it. Um, now, USC's never really had a problem getting wide receivers. I know I'm, I'm shifting this mainly to that scenario, that that situation. Yeah. But, like, I just feel like you're it's instant NFL if you go to USC and be a, a star wide receiver, right? Like, that's kind of what these kids are looking at. Yeah. he, uh, They've now got just, I think it's six or seven receivers that – have a decent level of, of experience and na- national ranking. All right. Position. You asked for the schedule. Okay. So here's USC's schedule this season. It goes, they open up with Rice at home, at Stanford, Fresno, at Oregon State, Arizona State, Washington State, at Utah. Then they get a bye week at Arizona, Cal, Colorado, at UCLA, and then they close with Notre Dame. Like, I feel like ten and two is reasonable. I I lean eight and four. I, I, obviously, we don't know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think Utah would probably be favored. Um, at, at right now, if you're if you're if you're building it right now, yeah, you're, you're going to say okay, Utah is probably favored. Um, maybe Notre Dame's favored. And maybe UCLA. Like all the other games should be wins. So nine and three. I think right in the middle, eight and four and ten and ten and two. Like right in the middle, yeah, nine and three. They're seems- probably, but 
a bunch of those games, they're probably between 50 and 65%. You flip yeah. that coin enough times, you're going to lose a, a couple probably. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just giving Riley too much credit, like just right off the bat, like he's just going to instantly make them a contender. Like I guess that's because I saw at Oklahoma like they were just a contender every year, but Oklahoma was always good anyway. Until until he starts involving his receivers more, he's dead to me. Like <laughs> the, the two the two man QB running back game that he he's been that he played especially in the back like mm-hmm. the back eight games or so this year. That's the game you play at Cincinnati when you have Ritter and Ford, and you you don't have enough the ability to recruit four and five stars at every single other position because right. that you can just, you, those guys are so much better and more athletic than everyone else that you don't need to involve every single player, uh, like the, the star talent that you have at other positions. When you're, when you're at Oklahoma, when you're at USC, you you should be playing that game. Like let your, let your, your alien wide receivers go for six, one fifty and two. Yeah. All right. So we talked about something right before we, we went live here um, about, the Hawaii head coach situation. Would you like to talk about it? So I, I'm seeing that Brent Mur- McMurphy t- just tweeted out that June D- Jones has declined an offer to become Hawaii's head coach. Which is funny because I could have sworn I sent you a link. You did. Within, the, within the last week, say, like, he interviewed him and he said he'd be open to it. Right, and that, I mean, I don't know if that was worth. I didn't. It. I, didn't I, I honestly didn't even watch the but, but I've been I've been following like the the news stream fairly. So closely as my as question that. then becomes: Does he want a coach, or is it? Do they insult him with a with a with an Andrew style offer, or did do they just? Is he just kind of playing so, chicken with them? I don't. I don't understand. It seems like when you are, I I. I'll probably I'm probably pretending to be more knowledgeable about Hawaii the the politics of Hawaii football than I actually. This am is here. this so, is your this is your wheelhouse. So I'm yeah, but I th- I believe when you are landing or in the process of landing an administrative position such as college football coach at Hawaii, you are dealing with multiple bodies of power such as the athletic director, the the people. I don't know what the body would you would call like the Hawaii government since it's a public university that like it is like very close to stays very close to the un, the government stays very close to the university like case that in was point a, Graham that was had, a big deal when they were firing Graham right exactly yeah. letting so him you're, go so you're I my assumption is that when you are in discussions for this job you're not just talking with the athletic director right you're having to negotiate and talk with all these other parties as well. And I assume something hit a snag, like maybe party A wanted him, party B didn't, or um, he put, he pushed back on his wants and needs and it, he, it just got shot down. Um, yeah. Oh, for by one, by one of those parties. I mean, like on this, on the surface, right. It, we, we all kind of assume that it's like, a, it's a dream job. It's coaching football out of Hawaii, but <laughs> It's it's fairly well known that it's like it's very a very unique job for so many reasons. Nick Nick and uh, Scott and Xavier on CFB Winning at Edge podcast. Do you listen to that? It's I don't. They they do it year round, so I, I listen to it religiously every week, especially in the in the off season. They just they talked about this for like an hour um, the, on their pod that just went up like earlier this week. There's some, there's so many unique challenges from the geography to the recruiting, the the. The university doesn't have a lot of money, so there's like that. There's that element of it too. So like the surface right. level idea of this being a dream job, in the sense that it's like you're living in Hawaii, when you talk about the day to day associated with it, it's probably a lot more interesting and probably not as uh, not what a lot of college coaches are necessarily looking for. Right. You assimilating yourself to the culture there is apparently like super not, not apparently, but is is super super important and, and even more so than it probably is in on a lot of other uh a lot of other schools so i can yeah. i can understand and relate to like all the different challenges associated with it yeah because like on the surface like you said it's it looks oh it's a dream job right yeah, it's you're hawaii. Coaching in hawaii. What, who cares you're in hawaii like yeah but like all those things you said like the the lack of a athletic budget like they every game that they travel there were every road game costs them a lot more money yeah. than other teams right like but they're, they're, they're not going an hour up the road to play anybody like it's it's a so, flight everywhere 
the result of this of these realities though is that they've unfortunately kind of gone back and forth between good hire and bad hire for what like 20 years at the point this point june jones to norm chow to did rollo come next i think i think rollo was next yeah. after chow, and then todd graham and now they finally had or i would like to think that it's still i would like to think that just because june jones said no maybe it's a negotiating tactic but they have it all teed up for the dream setup for like the next set them up for the next 30 years bring in june jones as head coach pry away timmy chang wide receiver coach at that's Michigan. what i've been reading like they've been trying to get him yeah, right make him head coach in waiting slash oc mm -hmm. I, and then you've got the current and the future covered on from all sides but yeah. trying to make everyone happy financially and then satisfying them from a power perspective too is probably exceedingly difficult you know, when you say what you say, like the to get ingrained in like the culture of Hawaii, like yeah. that might be one of obviously there's jobs where you the culture is important. Like I, I get it, but or you know how a lot of places they want to hire an alum, you know, because they know that they know the school, they know the traditions and all that. Like I don't know that it's any more important than it is at Hawaii, oh, right? Yeah. Like you know what I'm saying, like. Oh, you know, if you're in Michigan, oh, he's a Michigan man. Harbaugh's a Michigan man. We had to, we had to bring a Michigan man in. Like, did you really, or was he just ha he just happened to be a great coach that happened to also be a Michigan man? Like, it, whereas Hawaii, they kind of need a Hawaii guy, right? Like, that's yeah. that's kind of it. So, um, be interesting to see where they go with that. Um, you know, Hawaii. You know, we used to love it when those those big air the run and shoot. You know. Oh my god! The dude. Timmy Changs, the Colt Brennan style um, offenses that we would get, man, like those were fantasy dreams, right? Yeah, I mean, Rolo brought it back. It was right. It was humming. It was humming. Yeah, but um, it's like now. Well, Chow tried to like change it, right? Like he oh. tried to like go to the ground and pound <laughs> style. So we want, the, we just want the run and shoot. That's all we really want, at, right? At, at midnight. <laughs> at, yeah, at midnight. Um, so we'll see where they go with that. Maybe June Jones can work something out and he can go there. Yeah. Um, I think it's a negotiating tactic. I see. I do too. I, I want to find the, the link that I think I could have sworn that I sent it to you, but maybe not. You did. It's, not that, but it's fine. Not that big of a deal. Um, but anyway. All right. So I guess as far as, um, I asked you about head coaches or players you thought might make an impact. Anybody else that you're kind of thinking of? A lot of transfers. There's been so many transfers and just in the last like three days, like you can pick anybody. Um, oh man. I, I mean, I, I talked about him when I, when I talked with Jared, but I, I, I really want to buy all the way in on Plumley. Yeah. Uh, going to UCF. Yeah. Jared, Jared's too young. I mean, I don't want to talk sh shit on anyone, but Jared, Jared, it, it, it helps him in some ways. I think in that he's not doesn't have the scars, the battle, the battle wounds that we have from playing. He's, he's naive. He's naive <laughs> in some ways, and I mean, it's a learning curve. It's a learning experience. I mean, right. Soon he'll be the conspiracy theorist that we are when it comes to CFF, where every single thing that comes out of everyone, every person's mouth, you just doubt. For a good reason, but right. when it, but a good example I think is he is super skeptical of Gus Malzahn offenses, and it it's because all he's seen and I, after talking with him I and I, I heard his skepticism and I went and tried to understand it more and I looked back at recent years and what Gus has had as his quarterback and I forgot about Sean White the Sean White years the uh, the Stidham years and Gus hasn't had a true Gus quarterback since like nick marshall yeah so when i think about what plumbing and even then it was chaos right like it was like or it was like organized chaos but like it was it was awesome though yeah, like, yeah, owning, yeah. owning nick marshall you wouldn't it wasn't necessarily necessarily that you would get it every single week but like that that dude was fun to own like he he i i enjoyed that experience and oh yeah I think that when I think about what Plumlee can do in UCF's offense, I think along the lines of what Nick Marshall uh, did when Gus uh, was coach, 
They mm-hmm. brought in so much talent around him. I'm not. I don't really understand why because Plumlee's just going to run it 30 times a game, and they're going <laughs> to give it to Bowser the other 30, and that's going to be that. <laughs> but they brought in a ton of weapons, which, I mean, in some ways, makes me kind of want to question if he for sure has the job right. But like, I don't know why you bring in all these talented receivers and tight ends just to block for Plumlee and Bowser. But I mean, that's part of coaching, right? You con these guys over, you get the, you con them to kind of come to your program, and then sucks. I mean, maybe they, uh, maybe they transfer out, right? Getting back to the portal, but hope he'll get them for this year at least. Yeah, I, I guess I can see his his skepticism, like why he would have it, and like you said, it he just hasn't been around long enough to to see <laughs> to see the. I mean, Nick Marshall was what? What year was that? Yeah, it's 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 terrifying how long ago it actually was. It was right, what, like like nine, 13, ten years ago, almost. Like <laughs> when I think the Nick Marshall, I think the kick six game, right? That's like twenty thirteen. Yeah, so almost ten years ago. <laughs> but right, that, so. but when you think about the offense that Gus wants to run, that is it, right? I don't understand necessarily. Like, I I, don't, I would love to get in his head and understand what he was thinking with some of these quarterbacks that he's brought in, which don't seem like great fits to a system. And I think that some of it is like just getting infatuated with stars. Like when you can recruit like four, we got a four four quarterback, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because I I look at some teams that, that bring in quarterbacks. I'm like, why? Like, like Alabama, right. They can kind of put whoever they want there because they have the skill positions around them to, to help them flourish. Like you look at, they had Jalen hurts. Then you have Tua. Then you get Mac Jones, who's like the opposite of those two guys, right? Like Mac Jones isn't trying to run anywhere. And he can, I guess, if he has to, but he's not trying to. And then you get Bryce Young, who is the is as dynamic as they come, right? So if you were like, if you were watching Bryce Young and you were a four or five star pocket passing statue quarterback, like, does Alabama really want you after seeing the success of what they have in a Bryce Young. Maybe Alabama does just, just so they can fill a roster, I guess, of talent. So somebody else doesn't get them. But I wonder how much of that really goes – in recruiting, how much of it is let's get this guy so Georgia can't get him. Right, right, right. Yeah, I, I, I think we're on the same page. Or or Ole Miss or whoever, right? Like any of our rivals that, that can't get him. If we have him on our roster, even if he, we know he's going to transfer in a year or two, like at least they couldn't get him for the first couple of years. Like maybe that plays a role. I don't know, but it just seems odd. Some of the, some of the destinations that some of these quarterbacks end up at. Um, but there was a transfer I wanted to talk about and, and Chris probably won't like it. You know, Bo Nix going to Oregon. How do you feel about that? Like I'm not a big Bo Nix guy. Like a lot I mean, of people, I'm, yeah. Like a lot of people like him. It, and they think he's that, great. I get that he's a meme. Like at this point, that's basically what he is, right? But I, I've, I don't know. There's, I do not dislike and don't get as nervous as a lot of people do. I guess when it comes to his freestyling way that he works. When, once he drops back, like I saw I, one of my favorite tweets I saw this year during college football season is, was something along the lines of when Bo Nix drops back to pass, it's like he needs to explore every single inch of the pocket. Like it's a Zelda ju- dungeon. And I was like, that's, that's so perfect. That's, that is good. But I mean, in some ways that, that the Bo Nix strategy represents CFF perfectly or yeah. how to be, how to be successful in CFF in the sense that, I think he he thrives in chaos, so not every quarterback can do that. I um, for CFF purposes, though. I mean, I'm not I'm not super interested. Um, well, I'm not really necessarily talking about that. I mean, I feel like just like the the what's the word the the compatibility of him going to Oregon, I guess, is kind of where I'm I'm at with that. Like like you said, he lives in this chaotic scheme. Yeah. He works best in that. Like. I, he's had some moments where I'm like, wow, maybe he is actually good. I think he, I think he's a good, good quarterback. I think. But then I watch really other really moments and I'm like, dude, this guy sucks. Like, what are we doing here? Like, I'm, yeah. so I feel like there's a he's a hot and cold quarterback. That, oh, that for true? sure. Yeah, I, like, I, I don't know. I, I'll just keep my take on Bonick super simple, and that I think he's 
I think he's a good enough quarterback to get you to a New York New Year's Six game on a on a decent yeah. team on a good team. But for CFF purposes, I mean, I'm just, I'm not super interested. I, it, I think I think he's an upgrade to what they had, right? Like I feel like it's pretty safe to say. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not even talking about fantasy wise. I'm just talking about just pure being able to lead them to greater heights, right? Like, yeah, I, like, uh, I feel like yeah, they got a better shot like, at winning than they did before. It felt like Brown really got exposed in the back half of the year in some of the bigger games. So, right. yeah. Which, that's cool. When you think back, like, how in the hell did they beat Ohio State? <laughs> like, if you really think about that, like, it's like Oregon got worse as the year went along, and Ohio State got better. So it kind of leads me to a, a a college football playoff discussion. I don't know if we want to get into that here, but like, I'll I'll just say what I'm going to say. Early losses seem to count way more than they should. Like if you lose week one or week two, but you're a completely different team in week ten, is that not? I, I mean, obviously losses have to count. I get it. But does a loss in week one or week two not equal the same as a loss in week 10, week 11, when we know who you are? Like teams, I, like they I don't account them. for teams getting better. I hate so much of the playoff discussion, and my opinion on it generally comes down to the idea that the committee will just – they will retcon whatever logic they want to get the teams that they want in uh, more or less. So – I mean, I I don't want to derail if into the playoff discussion. I know it's it's it, that could be its own talk, yeah. but but I, I just feel like when you look at that Oregon Ohio State game, we all know if they played a hundred times, Ohio State's probably going to win ninety of them, right? Like, that that game and the Texas A and M Alabama game were the yeah. two. They were the two. Like if you were, they're the equivalent of throwing a perfect game by, yeah. the, coach, by the coaching staffs and on the field from A and M and right. And that's like that's what they had to do in order to win. Like A and M, like people thought, oh, A and M beat Alabama. Yes, they did, and credit to them. But they played it like you said, a damn near perfect game. Yeah. And how many times out of a hundred could they do that? Maybe five. Right. Like I just feel like those losses. Like look, I, I anybody that beats Alabama, you know what? They deserve to win it. Like they could say Alabama lost it. Now like, you you beat them, right? But I don't know. I'm not gonna go. Yeah, I'll just I'll I'll save that for another discussion about playoffs. But um, I guess my my thought on Knicks was that I think he's better than Brown, and I think that you might actually see Bo Nix flourish. Like I might be a little higher on him CFF wise than you are, only because like he's been playing at Auburn for these last few years right like he's gonna go to Oregon it's gonna be a completely different like defense he's looking at right like he doesn't have these guys in the SEC chasing after him every game like it might come a lot easier to him at Oregon yeah that's fair he I mean he's a great athlete that's right like I feel like he they they could utilize him not necessarily trying to he his this playmaking ability might flourish more in a system where it's more wide open. Well, it, it's embarrassing for me to admit it because I never want to admit that I don't know anything, but I, I don't remember what their offensive system is going to look like now with Moorhead going to uh, Akron. I don't remember what they brought in in the way of offensive coordinator. You know, at Oregon? Yeah. Well, you know what? I have the internet, and I think so do you, so we can look at that. <laughs> I'm not going to be uh, embarrassed. You can hear my uh, keyboard click. Uh, Kenny Dillingham. Oh yeah, dude. I that that brings m- my excitement down a little less. I think like I we saw we saw Norvell and Dillingham work at Memphis in that very specific environment of like mm-hmm. where they had these all these amazing chess pieces in the AAC, and then we saw them go to. Florida State, and it's been I. The only time they've had a success is when they've had. So maybe this is okay. Let's let's draw the success story here. 
the only time they've had success at Florida State is when they let Jordan Travis just do the Bo Nix thing and just freelance all over the place. So maybe maybe they just turn Bo loose at or or not they because it's just Dillingham, but maybe Dillingham just turns Bo Nix loose, lets him go all tra- Jordan Travis on everyone, and that's how Bo Nix has. That's how he operates, though, right? Like that's kind of where he thrives. Yeah. So. I mean, I think it's up in the air, like what kind of impact and fantasy wise he'll be, but yeah, um, for sure. You know, um, a couple other quarterbacks. How do you feel about Cordero going to San Jose State? Oh, I'm super excited, dude. Love Those, it, right? Like, it's, <laughs> it's a, I mean, I, with all the really fun options that we're seeing potentially taking over the Hawaii program, I kind of wish now that he just stayed home, but. Yeah. Hindsight being 2020, obviously, but they brought in like three of my, my best friends at San Jose state. They brought in him, Elijah cooks yeah. and Justin Lockhart who are like from in, especially in dynasty. I have those guys on all my teams, t- like targeted them specifically. And I have, I have like complete confidence in all of them individually who there's. So Justin Lockhart, are you familiar with him or no? Yeah. Okay, so Nevada receiver got yep. some run because Elijah Cooks went down with injury, which is – I don't want to go on too many tangents, but anyone who drafted Romeo does Dubs this year, congratulations. You lucked into Elijah Cooks getting hurt two years in a row, and that's why you profited. That's yeah. the only reason – that that's all I have to say on that, I guess. But anyway, <laughs> um, Lock, Lockhart stepped in a little bit with Torrey Horton. Um, and had success in Cooks's absence, but I, I learned through my my research that Justin Lockhart is Shaq's nephew, like Shaquille O'Neal. Yeah, <laughs> really. Yeah, so that that I I didn't realize that until late in the game. I was already super invested in Lockhart from an emotional and fantasy perspective. But that's like that's like a, a fact I would come up with. Like, Dude, yeah. <laughs> that extremely Zach, but I, I I love that trio. I feel really bad for Starkle as like a, as a as a huge Starkle believer going back to um, when we first saw him ball out in that bowl game against Wake Forest when he was at Texas A&M. Oh yeah, like I I, I love that dude. Like I I went down with the ship at Arkansas and then rose from the dead at San Jose State with him, and it sucked this year he didn't get to go out how he should have because they had absolutely nothing in town around him with the exception of Derek Deese. And like by the end of the season, it just felt like they, they ran out of options other than letting, then forcing him to t- throw the ball 40 times to people as talented as me and you, which sucks. <laughs> like that guy deserved better. But yeah. I was not going to have that problem with these, with these Nevada receivers transferring in, in with him. They essentially get a whole new offense. It's gonna be like, great, yeah. like just like on a silver platter. Here it is. Yeah, yeah. and we we've, we've seen what that team can do. Like when they had Starkle, Bailey Gauthier, and who's the other guy? I forget who. Oh, the guy who transferred to Ole Miss and then decided to declare for the draft, and nobody wanted him. Um, I forget I forget his name. Oh my god. Yeah, the slot receiver. He was awesome. But yeah. like when they, when they when they had that trio, they threw the ball fifty times a game, targeted the top two receivers sixty percent of the time, give or take, and it, right. it was awesome. Everybody balled out, everybody ate, everybody was happy, everybody was fat, everybody got fat from it. It was great. So I, I think we see that again with Cordero, Lockhart, and and Cubs. It's gonna be awesome. The Mountain West consistently. I know. I don't. I know. I don't need to sell you on a, as a Boise fan. It's the best conference. We always <laughs> see these awesome, like these team. It's awesome for so many reasons. Yeah, the games, the games start late. The offenses are they're not just fun, but I I feel pretty strongly that relative to every other conference, more or less, like the all of these teams have rich history, and that they they have offensive systems that transcend coaching staff. So it's it's you know what you're getting before the year. Right. It, it's great. Well, you know, it's funny. There was a. Um... I follow a lot of Mountain West, you know, beat writers and stuff more closely than a lot of people probably do. But um, there was a lot of interconference transfers, yeah, this year. Like, obviously, like in your case, Nevada to San Jose State. But there was like, there I remember seeing a few from. They were going to Colorado State. 
and go like from Wyoming. Wyoming had a mass exodus. I mean, we could talk about that. What do we think happened? Because something happened, dude. Something- like, I, I tried to I tried to start a conversation about it on Twitter, and Wyoming fans came out to to kill me. They're like, Craig Bull can win nine can win nine games with his eyes closed. He doesn't need any of this talent. It's like whoa, whoa, whoa! Like I just see all of your best players leaving the team. Like that's I just not my coincidence. Why. That's not by coincidence. Like I, I just don't believe they're saying, oh, we're all good enough to play for a Power Five team. Like yeah, some of them, dude. Might. But there's no way that all – I think, like, all three of their quarterbacks left. Yeah. Like, all of them. Like, not – Chambers went to a D2 school. He yeah. Went and then, yeah, because Ch- Chambers left, and then um, the other guy. Who the hell's the other guy? Um, Levi. Yeah, right. He le- he was the first domino, wasn't he? Yeah. He was the first domino, and then, like, a week later, Chambers decides, oh, I'm leaving too. That – and then I think, like, a third one left, but mm-hmm. – don't all, they, all they left for Arizona State and right. Nair, Nair did the the Tennessee like Texas your system. best players like guys that you would say have a chance to go pro all left. They still have Titus Swen. That's about it though. But I mean, I, you're good for him, I guess. But yeah, like, he's gonna get 40 carries now. I guess I'm gonna give him the ball <laughs> because oh, this will actually be lead a perfect segue into. The next thing I'm going to talk to you about. But, yeah, who's going to give him the ball? How do you lose all your quarterbacks? And then, you know you know what I thought of when all these things happened? You know that meme where the little guy's sitting there and the fire all around him? Yeah. yeah. It's fine. That's Wyoming right now. It is. I agree. Like, they are just on fire. And I, I have my theories of what maybe happened. But we won't discuss those. Here we've talked about it off off of air. You're before. saving that for the Patreon. Oh yeah, the Patreon. The the our patrons are gonna get that in the uh, Discord. Yeah, yeah. But um, anyway, we'll segue into the um, thing. I really just started the whole thing. I want to talk to you about. You tweeted out a list of schools that don't have a quarterback on their active on their roster, right? And that was what the tweet was. Yeah. Like they don't well, have so, a, a quarterback. I, I, phrase, I phrase it. It's so difficult for me to go back and forth between corporate answer mode and like not corporate. Here, let, let me let me let me read it just so. Dude, don't, don't don't put my corporate verbiage on the air. Like I feel like a scumbag for There's some schools that presently have nothing on campus representative of a starting quarterback for 2022, and it's a list of what 15 teams or so. Yeah. So of those teams. Which one or two do you think are the most, I would say... Ambiguous? uh, I was going to say more um, attractive for somebody to, A, transfer to or to take a role and become a fan. Number one has to be Louisiana Tech with Cumbie there, right? And I don't think we should count USC because Kayla Williams is going there. Right. We won't count them. Yeah. But I, I think it has to be Louisiana Tech with Cumbie being there. I don't count Aaron Allen as an option just based on everything we've seen. Well, 95% of what we've seen. He put up – are you familiar with Aaron Allen at Louisiana Tech? Very little. So every game that we saw him play in up until the mo- the one – it was one of the games that Austin Kendall missed with COVID. So he mm-hmm. started games this year. Aaron Allen, he started games last year and was all pretty reminiscent of Jack West getting playing time at Stanford, like the the definition of a disaster. And then I, he gets he starts against against I forget against who, but um, because Kendall's out with COVID, I think, or or an injury, and he throws like for like three hundred and three touchdowns. They cover that. I think they still lose. Charlotte, but that Maybe. was that was out of nowhere, but I still think that when I when I'm curating my list of options of teams that don't have a quarterback on campus that can really compete for a starting role I'm putting I'm putting them in there especially with Cumby coming in and I think he'll run something pretty uh close to an air raid so Aaron Allen's probably not an awesome fit for that so I from a fantasy perspective that's the one that's calling me I want to see if what he's able to get going in terms of bringing someone in I mean they lost well do they still I should I should probably check if they still if Kendall has another year. Um, I assumed he he was done because he's been in our lives for like 
seven years at this point. <laughs> um, but maybe that's why we haven't heard any noise. I mean, this list is so the way I build my my depth charts, um, and by build, I mean this is my first year doing it. Uh, but the way I've built my depth charts for college football this year is basically it's this is gonna be super nerdy uh from like a database perspective, but it's via activity. So when I see someone tweet about a player transferring, declaring, coming back, uh, leaving, retiring, or just tweeting about a, a player in the context of what he did the previous year or the next coming year, I consider that as like activity and I'll add that player to my depth chart. Or if I'm bored, really bored, I'll just go in and plug and play. But that's like a lot less, that is a lot less reliable than for instance, just then just referencing a static list of the players on each roster, right? That's like a, just a dimensional table of all the players that exist on that team. Um, so activity. So as a result, I, my list probably my depth chart uh, matrix probably has holes in it. Like this one, just simply because I haven't seen anything on Louisiana tech at all this off season. Like, I don't know if, I don't think they've taken any transfers. Like they, it, they, they hired Cumbie, before the the Texas tech, tech bowl game. And I haven't heard a peep out of them since then. Maybe their B Raider retired or something. And I'm just not paying attention, but I thought, fo- I mean, I follow all the aggregators as well. And I haven't seen anything out of that team. Um, but yeah. yeah, but assuming Kendall's not there for another yeah, year, first but, red shirt senior, he was what he was. So, I mean, but yeah, but you can't so weird. eligibility is so weird now. Like, Oh yeah. yeah. 2020 didn't count and like you get medical red shirts and stuff. So like, I don't, I don't even know. Yeah. I'm going to assume he's not there. Yeah. I mean, that's highly desirable in my opinion to be in that system. That'd be, that would be fun. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking at the other schools on the list. Like the only one that kind of jumps out app state is kind of fun. So I, I was, I, so I got, I got dude, this, this tweet got so much play. Chris from uh, Chris Moxley from Campus to Ken, I think, came in with a uh, oh, no okay. B- Mike 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 from uh, CFF side Mike Bainbridge. He came yeah. in and corrected me that Chase Bryce is back for year eight or whatever it is. Um, so, so right. App State's good to go. But well, you know, I had him. I had him for like I know two full years in Dynasty, Bryce. Right. Yeah. Then I cut him, and then I was like, ah, oh, I. I I should have had him on my roster this year. Like he was okay to keep, but like now I feel like is he reached his ceiling or is his is he going to be take his final year? He's going to be good. Like I'm, I don't know. I, some guys are like, I hold on to, but like sometimes you just got to learn to cut bait, and that's what I've learned playing yeah. Dynasty. Yeah, I guess. I mean, yeah, yeah, somewhat, somewhat. Your league that your league has shorter rosters than a lot of dynasty leagues. The other two that I'm in have much bigger rosters, and I can just like you can just hang on the guys forever with no consequence. Yeah, which, I mean some some people like that aspect of it. I I kind of like the aspect of yours where you're forced to actually make roster decisions as opposed to in a lot a lot of leagues. So, um, it, it, like anything else, it's all about uh, kind of the the league that you're playing in. But I he. Looking at my list that now cross checks close to yours in terms of uh, teams that have open quarterback, really nothing coming in in the way of talent presently on the roster. These three, I think, are at least a little interesting. Akron with Joe Moorhead there. So Joe, yeah. Joe Moorhead being a proponent of what we discussed how, that I hate, how the, the wide receivers are pretty much worthless. Like he already, he already conned. Uh, grifted Shockey, Jacques Louis, and Alex Adams, two transfers to come in uh, there. They lost two, right? Like, yeah, they Matt, lost. They Matt lost. Uh, and, uh, was it Mumford? Mumford? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, so he's he's conned uh, those guys to come in and, and uh, just block for Cam Wiley and whoever ends up being quarterback there. Um, so, but Could I mean, be the, quarter, the quarterback in Moorhead system generally is like. He's that that dude is going to be one A one B with the running back in terms of production. There is no one C, so that's interesting to me. If they get someone who's athletic in the MAC, like that, that could be fun. Yeah, I am interested in Ball State a little bit, just in the sense that they have talent returning at every other position with Carson Steele, Johannes Tyler, and Jay Sean Jackson. So if they if they take a transfer that can throw the ball, that 
I mean, at minimum, not necessarily the draft, but just add uh, that guy potentially as a back end QB when you get the Mac play that that could be fun. And then I, I need, I want to look more into Nevada because uh, no, okay, we I got have, it. That, I, I we so, while I'm thinking about it, I'm a Boise state guy. Everybody kind of knows that, but this guy entered the portal and he has yet to pop up. And I'm curious. Years? Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering where he ends up. Like he's good. Yeah, he's good, and I'm wondering – he's not going to go somewhere where he's going to have to, like, sit. Like He's going he's gonna to go somewhere – like, one of these teams on this list, like, Mizzou would be great for him, yeah. I think. Like, yeah. if, he, if, if his goal is to go pro, I think he needs to be front and center, and I, I feel like he's good enough to play there and be good. I agree. Do, right? That, do, I, he could have – I think if you put him in front of an objective audience, he could have won any of the quarterback competitions that he was in in the past couple of years. And that's not, not to say that Hank's bad, but I think that see, like every time we've seen Sears play, he doesn't just he's not just managing games, but he's actually going out and, and he can win games for your team. Yeah, like I was very impressed with him. Like I, I'm attached to Hank. I like Hank. I think I think what the attachment comes from is the Florida State game. You remember that as a true freshman, his first start, he goes out there and takes a beating. <laughs> I mean, he takes a beating every week, but like that's when you saw like he was out there taking a beating, making throws that you're like, okay, this might be the next Kellen Moore. Holy shit. Right? Like, obviously it doesn't turn out that way. I'm just saying, like, that's what it it felt like watching that. And you're like, man. How do you, I don't know how you could bench this guy. You know what he has in the tank, but like as they got like the years went by, it's like, man, he just I think he just holds on to the ball way too long. Yeah. It's not it's not protection anymore. It's it's you're not helping your protection. I hope we don't see it with Sears, but like that that feeling of disappointment I get, and I'm sure we all get when we see a really talented guy take land at an FCS school, like it just sucks. I don't think that's where he's going to go. I I yeah. think he'll go somewhere. It, it, one of these teams on this list that you tweeted out or a place where they have a quarterback, but they're not really sure about him yet. Like it could be up in the air, but yeah. he's going to have, yeah. he's going to have to go in there and win it like day one. Like they're going to have to look at him and say, okay, yeah, this guy is head and shoulders above anybody we have on this team. Yeah, definitely. But I don't know. I, I that was one. I, I remember when he when he left. I said, "Well, good for him." I just I'm curious where he ends up. For sure. Like I felt like like Oregon would have been a good spot for him before Knicks went, but uh, I don't know. But uh, as far as um, anything college football, anything you want to get out there before we. There's a couple uh, Ben Wallace card auctions I'm watching right now that are that are ticking down at the end, so I'm kind of keeping an eye on them. You can multitask, dude. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they keep pinging my phone. Like you have just, 50 max, just max bid that stuff. <laughs> Jeez, man. There's one that I, somebody just tried to like run it up on me. I'm pretty sure because like all the <laughs> other all the other comps that I've seen are like 40, 50 bucks, and I bid like 45, right? And they bid it like way up, and I, I bid it to like fifty, and it just kept going. I was like, okay, no, they're just they think that I'm just gonna pay whatever. Not gonna happen. Not getting me today. But um, anyway, back to college football. Um, anything dynasty you want to talk about? Like, I know like my team was looking kind of rough there for a minute, but like I've had three players. Three wide receivers transfer in the last couple weeks. Actually, really in the last week. So I had, um, obviously, Mario Williams, who I got in a trade near the end of like the deadline, by the way. I got um, Brendan Rice. I don't know if he'll be worth anything, but I have him. And Javon Baker from that just left Alabama for Kentucky. And I'm pretty excited about that one because he's been one I have not cut bait with, and he's been on my roster for two years. And like you said, it's it's hard to keep a lot of players in my league because you don't 
have the the rosters to do it. Well, the the portal adds uh, so many more outs for these players. If you just think about it from the context of poker, right? Like once you have that that pre, once you pre flop, you have that talent, right? You you now you want to see that through to the river even more with the like maybe they don't fire in year one or year two at their program where they're at at Alabama and Baker's case, right? You don't, you know, that guy's talented or mm -hmm. was assessed as being so coming out of high school, you want to see where that guy ends up. Cause the most he saw the field is, for Alabama. I mean, it was little, but he saw the field. He did. He did. But you, for just generally speaking, you want to see how that career plays out a little more in the sense that, I mean, historically be, before we had the portal, like you can, you could, build conspiratory angles of Alabama players that didn't see the field. Hey, I still want to own them throughout their duration because they could go D heart style and transfer to Colorado state and be an RB one, but it was much less likely. Now it's so much more likely in the sense, and it make it's going to, I think it for good reason, it makes it harder to cut guys that are, that come into your team initially with, with, with stars attached to their names, right? Four or five star type guys. You want to see where they end up um, after if even if they don't make it in year one, year two. Yeah, it's definitely interesting because like, you're seeing like I think I said it earlier in this this show here, like you're seeing guys that not necessarily didn't get to play, but just didn't like their situation, so they just left. Like they were they had a good season or a good they were you look like Levi Williams right for Wyoming. Like he had a fantastic bowl game. Like you're like, oh my god, he's gonna be awesome next year, right? And then he decides to leave. Yeah. So we see so little of this, and we we hypothesize about the, the cause so much. I my assumption is so much of what is happening in terms of generating players going to the portal is coaches from other schools reaching out to them and effectively recruiting them, and that's why they enter the portal. Like see, that's I. I it's interesting you say that because I feel the same way. I've wondered how the portal really works. Yeah. Like they say, Hey, look, I can't really talk to you until you're in the portal technically. So just go in the portal and we can talk <laughs> basically. Cause I feel like it's, it's, I've seen guys go in the portal and then a week later, Oh, I'm back. Like, so why'd you go in the portal? Like there was a reason you went in the portal Yeah, and it has to do, it has to be some, some technical i don't know all the rules so right. forgive me i don't but i think you're right though i think there's some people reaching out to these guys and saying hey look you may have better options if you go in the portal like there's some schools that could use your talent i don't know i it just seems odd like i'm not i'm not worried about why a kid decides to leave as far as like personal stuff like it's his it's it's his life at the end of the day right like it's his decision but like I just I I think what we're about to see, if we haven't already seen it, is you have the power five and the group of five, right? Like they they've always been separate, but like it was kind of like, all right, you had one A and then one B, right? That was the level. Now it's almost widening that gap between the two, and it's a, almost an audition for the the power five. Like these school, these guys say, you know what? I didn't get a scholarship offer from an SEC school. So I'm going to go play at Troy. I know you had a big thing about Troy on, on Twitter recently, but <laughs> I'm just using them as an example. So like you go to Troy, have a thousand yard season. Oh, Hey guys, I'm available now. You, now that you've seen me play and now they're like, okay, yeah, we got a spot for you now. Like, I feel like it's their audition for a power five school more so than it ever has been. You bring up, I mean, it's interesting because, Two of two views that I hold very strongly are in this case very much at odds. Where I am, even though I'm a diehard Georgia fan, I am all about all 130 schools. I like to like I consider everyone to be equal equal in my eyes in the sense that like I don't, I'm with you there. I don't, I don't believe in that power five autonomy stuff like that. It's such, it's total garbage to me. Like I, I understand how it works in practice, but like you're everybody's F, FBS, and I don't I I hate the direction that things are generally moving but the, the what's at odds with that sentiment is the idea that i also 
believe in maneuverability of these of the athletes via the transfer portal. Like I go, dude, go get your go get your bread. Go do you go do whatever you want to do. But the the result of that is what you're saying in terms of the divide growing between P5 and G5. So, I mean, I, I guess if I, I mean, I'm not going to lose sleep over it, but if I wanted to reconcile those two things, I don't know how I necessarily would because they're directly at odds with one another. Right. No, I'm, I think I'm exactly on the same page as you are with that because like, not that I agree that there should be a this widening gap, but I feel like that's just the way it's going. It's always been a gap like in in not in my eyes like i i with you i I like all 130 teams they're all important to me um (laughs) i i and as a matter of fact i i might enjoy watching wyoming play colorado state in six degree snow right like more so than i might watch florida play Ole miss right like it's just to me and you people like us we enjoy that sociopaths if you will right Yes. And it, it just sucks because like you get a guy – if you're a fan of one of these group of five schools, it's got to suck when you have a guy that's a star and then he gets poached by yeah. a big school. And he, how is he going to say no? You know what I mean? Like if you play at Memphis, like, yeah, it's, okay, you're, you're – it's not a small school, but if, if Alabama comes calling after your 1,500-yard – Bolitnikov season, you're gonna go right. <laughs> like Alabama isn't just calling you to put you on their bench. Like I just don't think that that's. How. Look at Jamison Williams, right? He he somehow didn't get on the field for Ohio State, <laughs> which is wild when you really think about it. But then you see the talent that they have. It's like, yeah. who do you take off, right? But they didn't bring him into Alabama to sit. And I know that's not that's not group of five to power five. That's that's two juggernauts, you know, that you're talking about there. But like those big power five schools, they don't just get these guys to come sit. Okay. Generally. Let me let me let me tangent this. What so I don't believe there's any chance that Bama enters next year with their re- receiver core receiving core looking how it does right now. What it like I wonder what they're going to do in the way of the portal there because they are getting they're getting crushed with Bolden, Mechie, and Williams all going pro. And I mean, it was Baker, kind of Baker leaving, Baker transferring, yeah. But then, and then yeah. Hall, Hall had a rough had a rough end of the season. I, I mean, it, dude, I thought he, I I mean, I get that he made a couple of mistakes, but I mean, relative to so, think about how we thought about a, a, I don't know how you say it, a Jai Hall three no a month ago let's say a month two months ago we thought that he was out the door from bama that his freshman story freshman season story had been Billingsley written. left too by the way yeah and it had been written with basically him just being penalized or by saban uh for just being a bad teammate and that's why he didn't get on the field so i I mean, relative to where it was a month, two months ago, his freshman season's a success in my eyes. Dude made legit plays in the national championship. But, Obviously, he like he cost them in some ways, but like he didn't. Come I'm not even gonna talk about that. that. Like, I feel like to be on the field in the national championship game, you have to you have to have some talent. Like, yeah. I mean, that, that's yeah. a given, right? So it's, it's him. But like I watch it. I'm gonna pull. I'm gonna pull, and I hate it so much that I'm gonna do this, but. I'm going to pull a Fusu, whatever the hell his name is, Fusu. analysis. Yeah, some analysis here on him. When I watched him run, run routes, he looked so, I want to say lost isn't the word. It was like his brain was moving faster than his body could. could <laughs> like he looked uncomfortable running routes. And, yeah. and maybe that's just the fact that he's a freshman and he hasn't truly learned the nuances of, of, of route running, but he looked, he looked in over his head as far physically in that sense. Yeah. Um, that could all change again. He's a freshman. So it's, they have, they have him, Jojo Earl, Ja'Cory Brooks, and then lot to a tight end for any other school. That's, that's I mean, plenty. Yeah. But I, dude, I, I can't imagine them entering 
2022 with that is like with Ja'Cory Brooks who looked dope down the stretch. Like he's not going to be their WR1 going into the year. There's no way. He's going to be important. I think he's – I think he starts. Yeah. I mean, I think that's that's probably a given, right? I think he starts. Um, yeah. It could be a freshman in this class that they get that comes in and he's a monster. Um <sighs> I'm trying to think if there's anybody out there that's they were trying to they were trying to recruit Butte, right? Like that's what everyone was saying, but he's oh, he's yeah. staying like Ke- Kelly's not Kelly's not letting him out, absolutely not. Um, yeah. but the, so I I think what happens is someone totally unexpected enters the portal and then is at Bama a week later. Like enters the portal and is at Bama within a week. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I guess I guess I could see that. Um, what about uh, the Taj Harris? Yeah, there, he's still in the portal. Like he could show up there. But that's like the equivalent of when they brought in uh, your boy Garrick Dieter from Bowling Green to win a national championship as like their WR four. That's how I equate that. Now they're gonna you're gonna see At Perry in the in the portal, or magically see. Jalen Robinson or Jordan Addison enter the portal and then wind up at Bama a week later. That's actually a good call. I, Addison would be a would be a great call. I think that's very highly possible. They should have they should have promoted Marion to OC. Now, now they you reap what you sow. Yeah, like Addison to Bama would be would actually work, right? Like, <laughs> be amazing. I'm kind of liking that. Yeah, the more you say it, like I'm like, you know what? There might be something there, but yeah, I feel like this. They're they're not going to just run with what they've got. No, You're right. They're, like they saw the success that Jameson Williams like that. Yeah, he was an elite talent, but like, there's elite talent out there that's just waiting for Bama to call them. Definitely. So, um, like Mario Williams would have been cool, but. That would have been cool, but he's gonna. He was always gonna follow, yeah, Riley to USC. But all right, I guess we can leave it there. Um, unless there's anything else you want to add, um, we're good. Let's do this again soon. We'll definitely do it again soon. Um, and I guess that's all we've got for today. So um, until next time, later. Later. <laughs>